This is Truth Dig Radio. I'm Peter Shear, and I'm joined by Brandon Garrett, a professor of law at the University of Virginia and author of Convicting the Innocent, which the New York Times recently described as a gripping contribution to the lit- literature of justice. Uh, welcome. Thanks for having me. So just to set things up a bit, in your book, you examine the cases of 250 people who were wrongly convicted since the late 1980s. They spent an average of 13 years in prison. 17 of them were sentenced to die and 80 to spend the rest of their lives in prison. And it's filled with lots of just really outrageous uh, facts and statistics. So how, how did this happen? Is, how did the system put all of these people uh, in jail, some to die? So these people were all exonerated only because DNA testing came along in the late 80s, early 90s. Had it not been for DNA testing, they would have spent many more years in prison, and some of them likely would have been executed. So, you know, in some ways, these people were the lucky ones, and it's an optimistic story about errors getting corrected. But what's so disturbing about these cases is that it wasn't the criminal justice system really correcting these errors. It was the happenstance that DNA happened to be preserved in these cases. There have now been more than 250 people freed by DNA in the U.S. And what I wanted to do was to go back and try to figure out what went wrong. We've all seen news reports about these exonerations. I wanted to go back and get the original trial records, the confession statements, police reports if possible, to to get a sense of, you know, why why did jurors originally convict these innocent guys? What, What happened in these cases? And uh, what, what I saw when I reviewed those records was that, you know, if I had been a jury, a juror on one of these cases, I, I think I would have convicted too. The evidence at the time that the jury saw, and almost all these cases did go to a trial, seemed powerful. And, and that's what makes these cases terrifying. The evidence was flawed. It was contaminated in all sorts of ways before trial. But what the, what the jury saw it was a case that seemed pretty open and shut. And I don't think anyone really thought much about these cases at the time. And so it, it makes you wonder how many other run-of-the-mill criminal cases there are out there, since, since DNA testing can't typically be done, where, where the same mistakes might have happened. Well, I think that's what's so disturbing about, uh, you said, was it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 40 of these cases the, the, the convicted had confessed to crimes that they didn't commit and were put away? Yes, and so in each chapter of my book, I talk about a different type of evidence that contributed to these convictions. And then I look back and look at the road to exoneration and what happened afterwards. But I talk right away in the book about confessions because people just don't think that anyone would lightly confess to a crime they didn't commit. Right? The confession evidence is incredibly powerful before a jury for good reason. Well, we all know that, yes, sometimes we may not tell the truth over little things. But to confess to a serious crime, a murder, and it's typically in homicide cases where interrogations are conducted, right, it's hard to imagine how that would happen. You know, we, we all understand, sure, if, there is, if police are torturing us, right, we might confess mm-hmm. to something we didn't do. If there was physical force involved, sure. But these cases typically didn't involve that. They used the psychological techniques, and the detectives asked all sorts of questions. And uh, interrogations happened over many hours. They were long. Um, some of these people were juveniles and mentally retarded. Quite a few of them were. And, and maybe we could see, how, okay, someone who is maybe more vulnerable might cave into police pressure. But even still, even given all that, these cases are even more surprising. Because I think, you know, we might figure, okay, if we were on a jury and we saw someone who was a juvenile who'd been interrogated for 30 hours, we might, we might wonder. Or if it was someone who was mentally retarded, we might figure, okay, that, someone like that might cave into the police. They may not really understand what's going on. But what prosecutors told the jury in these cases was, look, even in the cases where there was a juvenile or someone who was mentally limited, they said, you know this guy was telling the truth. Forget about the fact that he was disabled. Forget about the fact that it was a juvenile. Forget about the fact that this interrogation went on for days and days. This person gave facts that only the real killer could have known. Those details couldn't have been known by anyone. The police kept them out of the public. And this guy could tell you what color the victim's couch was and how many uh, cuts were made on the victim's body and how the victim was strangled, the, the kind of details that only the killer could have known. And so jurors thought, look, this is, this is an easy case to convict. This is a true confession. Right. And, and now we know that those details had to have come from the police, that these confessions were interrogated. But since there was no real record of what happened in the interrogation room, these were not recorded interrogations, or if they were, just the very end was recorded. There was no way for the jury to know who said what, really. And so it's just another example of how, because we don't document interrogations carefully in this country, except in a growing number of jurisdictions that have responded to these false confession cases, 
there's just no way for the jury to assess what happened, who said what. And, and who said what is the crucial thing when you have these claims that, oh, someone volunteered the facts that only the killer could have known. Well, did they really volunteer them, or did the police feed those facts? And we can't know unless there's a recording. Another um, instance of, 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 of testimony that leads to sort of an open and shut case that you show is, is false and is really disturbing is bad forensics and bad forensics testimony. Can you jump into that? Sure, and I'm sure some of your listeners know there have been scandals around the country where different crime labs turn out to have poor quality control or analysts that were misreporting results. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we, we don't know today the scope of the problems at many of our crime labs because they still don't have quality control or good error checking. And even in response to some of these wrongful convictions, there just haven't been audits to check whether the analysts are getting it right. And uh, most of these cases that I looked at involved forensics. And that's sort of by definition. These are the cases where years later when the forensics improved and DNA testing could be done, DNA testing was done. But at the time of their trials, you know, basic forensics were done, often on rape kits and cases involving a sexual assault. And hairs were compared, uh, bite prints were compared, fibers were compared, and basic ABO blood typing was done in these cases. Uh, And those techniques you'd think would be pretty straightforward, They don't involve a lot of fancy computers or programming or machines or equipment like in a DNA lab today. And the boundaries of some of those disciplines are clear. Everyone knows what percentage of the population has an A type or a B type or an O type or doesn't secrete any blood type. And yet you had these forensic analysts on the stand in these cases, in case after case. More than half the cases had some problem with the forensics. Where the analysts misstated statistics, exaggerated the forensics, made the forensics that were totally inconclusive seem like they matched the uh, the criminal defendant, basically tailoring their, t- their their case to the prosecution case rather than just explaining the science in an accurate way. And it makes you wonder, you know, if these guys weren't trying to frame innocent defendants, were these forensic analysts testifying this way all the time? And what do they say in their reports? What do they say in cases that haven't had the kind of scrutiny that these cases have had since we now know these guys were, were innocent? Uh, so it really calls into question the, the quality control in forensics. But still more disturbing, a lot of the techniques were used were unreliable techniques where they were just simply errors. And they said that, you know, a dozen hairs match the defendant. We know now that in a dozen cases, they were, you know, in a dozen comparisons, they were wrong. And so, you know, how accurate are these techniques if, if they can mismatch evidence so easily based on their own subjective conclusion that two things look alike under a microscope?